Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, my name is Manan Ahmed. I um, work in an adjacent uh, building, and I am in, of an adjacent field. I'm a historian. And uh, I wanted to start by congratulating um, Laura and Dare for just a wonderful set of uh, talks and panels um, all day. And at least for me, has been tremendously <clears throat> um, both inspiring but also uh, generative. So <clears throat> thank you for all of the work that has, been, that has gone on to it. Um, we have our last panel before our keynote. And um, I know we're running slightly behind. Um, so what I'll do is uh, quickly um, introduce our two speakers who are both representing um, two teams. Um, all members are not here precisely because uh, one, in one case I've been told uh, as a result of uh, border crossing. <clears throat> and so um, I think that we can add that to our list of questions to raise. Um, so this panel is um, concerned with um, cities without borders, without and fronteras. And what's interesting to me listening to the last two panels um, since Wendy's excellent keynote is that mapping, which is perhaps the, um, I would argue, the first um, and most successful colonial technology that has done more to shape um, both colonized bodies and colonized geographies remains uh, an unsettled um, <clears throat> presence in our midst. And <clears throat> part of that unsettlement is that maps uh, and lines on maps are always uh, embodied and um, uh, material and borders are perhaps the most manifest reality um, of that embodiment and that reality. So we have um, two, uh, as I said, two sets of, um, two speakers representing um, two collectives. Uh, let me um, introduce the two speakers who will be speaking. Um, we'll have uh, Sebastian uh, Kobarubias, who is an assistant professor at the Global Studies Department at University of North Carolina in Charlotte. Um, with a PhD in human geography from UNC Cha Chapel Hill. Um, and <clears throat> we have Charles, uh, so we have uh, Lorenzo Pezzani, who is an architect and a researcher, and a PhD from Goldsmiths, University of London, um, and is the co founder with Charles Heller of the of Watch the Med platform. And um, Sebastian is the co founder with uh, Maribel Casas Cortez, who's not here, uh, who's also at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So please uh, welcome this, the first speaker, uh, Lorenzo, right? Charles. Right. Who's going first? Thank you. And, oh. So they did set up oh, that first. Oh, okay. Yeah, so All right. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. We are confused. We thought like it was the other way around. But yeah, yeah, sure. No worries. Um, all right. Thanks a lot for the introduction and, and for the invitation, especially Laura. It's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. And, you know, I'm, as you know, we have been following and admiring the, the work of the center for many years. So it's, it's really great to be here with you today. And, um, as, as it was said, I mean, it's, it was a bit of like last minute surprise that it was that I'm here on my own and that Charles Heller, who is my, my partner in this project, could not come. And obviously the, the bitter irony of like a panel on border having his, his members kind of halved by border control, it it's, uh, will not be lost, hopefully. Um, so these reflections really emerge that I'm going to share with you today emerge from the context of a project called Forensic Oceanography, which is the kind of bigger umbrella uh, in the frame of which we have worked on this project, uh, Watch the Med, that was mentioned earlier, which Charles and I have initiated um, in 2011 in the wake of the Arab uprisings. And it's a project that somehow uh, tries to document and analyze the spatial and aesthetic conditions that have led to more than 30,000 uh, deaths uh, over 30 years 
uh, across the Mediterranean Sea. And so it's, it's a project that, that sits somehow across different uh, you know, disciplines and, and, and impetus and, and you know, uh, between investigative journalism and, and activism and scholar research and, and spatial analysis. But really at the core of this, it's an attempt to uh, uh, somehow you know, uh, expose the violence that we would argue it's a structural product of, of border control and try somehow to attribute responsibility for it. What I'm going to do today is also try to link, you know, to kind of address the context, the specific context of this conference, uh, try to, uh, you know, link it to a, a new project, or rather, I should say, the, the project of a project that we are somehow starting with Charles, uh, and that tries to establish some sort of parallel between the space of the sea and the space of the city. So it goes like this. Um, in May 2012, the then UK Home Secretary Theresa May announced in an interview to the Daily Telegraph the introduction of new groundbreaking legislation in the field of immigration control. The aim of these new measures, she emphatically declared with language that the journalist that was interviewing her described as uncharacteristically vivid, uh, is to create, and I'm quoting, um, sorry, is, and I'm quoting her, to create here in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal migration. Work is underway, she further explained, to deny legal, illegal immigrants access to work, housing, and services, even bank accounts. So with the passing of two successive bills in, in subsequent years, getting a job, renting a flat, using a bank, driving a car, getting access to medical care and education, i.e. all those activities and services, one might argue, the intensity of which has been taken by some as an index, as a, as a measure somehow of urbanity, as a, have been transformed into a crucial tool of border control. While the legislation obviously extends across the whole country, it is in urban areas that it works best. If the urban can be understood in the words of Abdul Malik Simon as a huge intersection of bodies in need and with desire, uh, sorry, as a huge intersection of bodies in need and with desires in part propelled by the sheer numbers of them, or as argued by Ross Asko Adams, as an apparatus of circulation, it is clear that it is the intensity and speed of urban interactions and the data, especially the data that these interactions generate, that is of interest to the government here and that makes of the urban a perfect locus of border enforcement. So as somebody who, as I was saying, for the past six years has been invested in analyzing the multifarious ways in which the Mediterranean Sea has been progressively but relentlessly transformed into the deadliest crossing in the world, the epicenter of those landscape of death that global borders represent, uh, the turning of cities into hostile environments carry an eerie resemblance, which does not only make possible, but I would argue even demands that we forge a conceptual language and, and somehow a conceptual optics that would allow us to see and understand these processes together uh, as different but intimately interconnected expression of the same apparatus of border control and of its expansive multiscalar reach, uh, as, as Sebastian will also, um, I'm sure, argue later. Here, the distinction between what is supposedly natural and what is artificial, between cities understood as human feats on the one side and ocean, deserts, and mountains as natural accidents on the other, is fundamentally put in question and blurred. So this emerges very clearly, um, for example, and has, been be, uh, and has been most fully theorized in the context of the Mexico-US borders, where the notion of prevention through deterrence was adopted by US border guards as early as 1993. This enforcement strategy calls for the deployment of massive numbers of agents along the sections of the border that are easier to cross, usually around urban areas. These concentrations, in turn, uh, lead migrants to attempt to cross in deserts or other inhospitable areas, often leading to cases of death. So prevention through deterrence somehow reveals how the desert and its physical characteristics have been enlisted, deployed, and harnessed as a crucial mechanism of border control. These terrains constitute, might I argue, an already natural boundary uh, due to their physical characteristics, but at the same time, those very characteristics are weaponized in order to turn them into a style environment. Um, 
so there is a process of design at work in the becoming deadly of the deserts, ocean, and mountains ranges that have been taken as, as borderlands, right? And there is a, um, a concept that Elizabeth Gross uses of, of geopower. She, she calls this geopower, you know, referring to the ways in which natural environment kind of, you know, uh, sustain or, 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 or put in, in danger life. Um, and, and I would argue, let's say here we see how this process of design kind of deploys geopower according to very specific policies and, and practices. So these processes are particularly visible in the area in which, as I've already mentioned, my research has been focusing over the past few years, i.e. the Mediterranean Sea. There are obviously many factors that, that have contributed to this weaponization of the Mediterranean, some of which um, um, start where, very well before the physical, board, uh, the physical location of the border, right? And of course, you know, one of the main factors is the, is the denial of visa uh, uh, that push people into, into this both, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that then sh have shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. Um, elsewhere, I've spoken in more detail about how the complex and overlapping jurisdictions at sea that you can see represented here play a fundamentally, uh, fundamental role in creating the conditions that structurally led to the death of migrants at sea. Uh, today, however, I'd like to focus more specifically on the role of media and surveillance technologies, and, and even more specifically on the ways in which these produce selective conditions of appearance and disappearance, of audibility and inaudibility, of visibility and invisibility, and how this aesthetic regime is crucial in the process of weaponization that I've just mentioned. So contrary um, to the popular representation of the maritime territory as a homogeneous and empty expanse, the sea appears today, uh, and that's something that you know, we're very concerned with in our, our work, the sea appears today, in fact, as a technologically mediated space, thick with events and complex relations between people, environment, and data. A vast sensing apparatus constantly records, transmits, and store, uh, and, and broadcasts information about what happens at sea. So many of these technologies were not originally deployed with the purpose of border control, but still they are somehow integrated into it. And you see here, you know, kind of classic oceanographic observational techniques, um, and and you know, an example from how you know meteorological data is also collected and, and used. Um, uh, vessel tracking technology such as this one, and I'll talk a bit more about uh, uh, AIS, this, this specific vessel tracking technology later. Um, this is like a, a, a screen for a chart plotter on board one of the fishing vessels in, uh, uh, of the, of the um, trolling fleet in, uh, in the south of Sicily, in Mazzara del Vallo, where basically they record with G uh, GPS all the kind of, you know, the places where they've been fishing uh, in the, over the past few years. Uh, others of these means are specifically geared at detecting illegalized border crossing, so you see here, like optical cameras, uh, radars of various sorts, coastal radars that are deployed along the coast of Italy in this case, uh, as well as satellite imagery that is also routinely used uh, to, in, you know, to, to detect uh, illegalized migration. All of these different sources and different kind of feeds of information are there combined um, and contribute to, the, to create what, you know, in jargon is called an integrated uh, maritime picture, where, you know, again, all these feeds are, are uh, you know, brought together and displayed on a cartographic uh, 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 background, let's say. Uh, the sensorium dam has come to play also a very important role in the context of the policing of migration across the Mediterranean, insofar as states use it to shed light on acts of unauthorized border crossing. However, despite the optimistic promises of full-spectrum visibility that are ubiquitous in state agencies and surveillance companies' communiques, the Mediterranean scopic system does not produce a totalizing panoptic view, but rather operates a form of incomplete and patchy surveillance that constantly run up against the frontiers of information quantity and resolution. And here you see like a, an old uh, slide from, from the European Commission Joint Research Center that shows the kind of intensity uh, with which satellite imagery is acquired over specific areas uh, uh, of the sea as opposed to others where basically there is none over, over a certain amount of time. Um, this is why 
similar to what happens along the US-Mexico border, as I was mentioning earlier, the control of the EU's maritime frontier also focuses on what security consultants and companies have defined as focal routes, uh, which they say account for more than 70-80% of detected cases of illegal immigration by sea, and whose location are dictated by geography. So it's usually uh, let's say straight or narrow passages uh, where, where European countries uh, lie close to, uh, you know, uh, almost touching the coast of Northern Africa or, or the Middle East, right? So Gibraltar and the, the Sicily Channel as well as the, uh, uh, you know, Aegean. Um, these places of, of somehow logistical tension are the ones where the surveillance required, and again I'm quoting from this kind of uh, 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 consultancy companies, uh, uh, you know, uh, writing. Um, I was saying where the surveillance required is highly intensive, detailed, and semi-permanent in virtually constant areas. Um, Rather than, sorry, rather than uh, stopping the inflow of illegalized migration, however, the increasing militarization and, and surveillance apparatus of the easiest point of crossing has instead resulted in the splintering and funneling of migration routes toward longer and more perilous areas. This is one of the main factors leading to death on a structural basis, the fact of turning the sea into an unwilling killer, while at the same time distancing the death of migrants further from the eyes of the European public and presenting them as natural, uh, ultimately shifting the blame for them onto the sea itself, right? So usually these are really presented as somehow natural catastrophe for, for which no one is, is really responsible, right? Yet the sea can also be a witness, and, and you know, our work of, of, of the last year has really been uh, you know, uh, geared to, to, uh, to try to make this point in a sense, right? Uh, BDA becomes both the tool to harness the geopower of the sea, but also to address and to try to contest its deadly effects. Um, AIS, uh, a vessel tracking technology that is mandatory for ship over a certain size and that is freely accessible on specialized online platforms, has been central to this endeavor, especially since 2014, when the involvement of merchant ships mandated to carry AIS started to be increasingly called upon by Coast Guard agencies to rescue migrants in distress in the Mediterranean. Uh, so it was at that point that tangled and zigzag tracks unequivocally signaling an ongoing rescue operation started to become more and more ubiquitous um, on online vessel tracking platforms, thus making of AIS a privileged observation point of the shift and more generally of what was happening at sea, right? So here you see some examples. So each one is a track of a, of a commercial uh, ship, in this case, oil products tanker, uh, and you see this kind of zigzag, right, that is somehow in, in, uh, uh, in opposition to the usual tracks that you would see on this website, right, where, where you know, kind of uh, the commercial traffic is, is going on a straight line from point A to point B. Um, and you could really see at this moment in 2014, like this becoming more and more ubiquitous of the coast of Libya, so which is like the, the coast down there. Obviously, you know, in order to, to carry out the rescue operation, ships have to, you know, divert their course, slow down, and, you know, search, um, start a kind of search pattern, uh, uh, and, you know, turn around, return on a certain point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So each of these somehow became an indicator that a rescue operation was happening or had just happened. Um, in our Death by Rescue report, which we published in 2016, we used this data to demonstrate how this increasing involvement of merchant ships was a direct consequence of the EU's decisions to deliberately shut down state-led search, uh, search and rescue operations, thus leaving a large rescue gap that shifted the burden of extremely complex search and rescue operations onto commercial vessels. These, however, these, these vessels, as the shipping industry representative had warned on several occasions, were unfit for the task, and their intervention led to repeated tragedy, as in April 2015, when two shipwrecks occurred at the very moment of rescue by merchant ships, leading to more than uh, 1,200 uh, 1, deaths in a single week. 
So relying on AAS data, we were able to reconstruct these instances of death by private aid rescue and to denounce the little effects of the use policies of an assistance. And this is one of the cases that we documented, a shipwreck that happened on 18th of uh, April 2015, and which is the largest recorded shipwreck that has happened in the Mediterranean where more than 800 people died on a single uh, occasion. Um, and again, you kind of see this kind of tangle of, 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 uh, uh, of ship tracks, right? Uh, this was the ship that was mandated to, uh, to go and, and, uh, uh, and rescue the migrants. So you have to imagine this kind of, you know, meeting point at night in the middle of the sea between like this 150 meter long commercial cargo ship with 15 people of crew and a small fishing vessel 20 meters long, more or less, with 800 people on board. Um, and this is another map that we created for this report uh, where, you know, I was talking earlier about this idea of like design being, you know, uh, a crucial somehow element of, of this turning of the scene to an hostile environment. And here you can see really a kind of design of operational zones. Uh, so in, 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 uh, in green, is the operation that had been started by the Italian government uh, called Mare Nostrum that was really uh, at its, at its, as its uh, main task, you know, operating rescue. This was then accused of constituting what people were calling a pull factor and so was, was interrupted and was replaced with another operation called Triton, which you see here highlighted in, in purple, uh, which was patrolling much further north and with a lot less uh, you know, means, and especially uh, this operation was really geared towards border control rather than rescue, right? So this, this is what then led to the April shipwrecks that, that we document in our report. Um, vessel tracking technology is just one of the many technologies uh, and techniques that we have used to offer an alternative reading of the ocean, transforming it, as I was suggesting, into a witness of sorts. This meant mobilizing against the grain the vast and technological mediated sensorium which I've just described. While these technologies are often used for the purpose of policing migration, um, we have used them in this case, as well as in many others, to reconstruct and denounce the violence of the border regime. Instead of replicating the technological eye of policing and its untenable promise of full spectrum visibility, we chose to exercise what we call the disobedient gaze, redirecting somehow the light shed by the surveillance apparatus away from illegalized migration and back towards the act of policing itself. And again, trying to show how this was leading and is still leading to death on, on, on a structural basis. Uh, this was somehow also made possible that by the multiplication of, of you know, different sources that were non, kind of non-state uh, sources of information and, and images and, and data, right? And this has to do somehow with a process that, you know, on firm land has been called, uh, you know, citizen media and the spread, of course, of like, you know, smartphones, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but also by new kind of activist practices such as uh, the Alarm Phone, which is a project that we have been, you know, helping somehow to, to, uh, to put in place, which is a uh, somehow emergency, activist emergency hotline that kind of responds 24 hours uh, a day to, to distress calls from, from the Mediterranean, um, as well as the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, M m more and more cameras, let's say, are present at sea, right? And, and this is a case that we are investigating right now um, where, uh, you know, there was a kind of almost violent confrontation between an NGO that was uh, doing rescue at sea and the so-called Libyan Coast Guard, which is, you know, empowered and, and uh, sustained by the European Union. Um, and so migrants were somehow in the middle and, and uh, you know, getting on, on, on board of the NGO ship meant being brought to, uh, to Italy, getting onto the Libyan uh, boat meant going back to Libya on, on, in conditions that we know are, are horrific. Uh, and so a kind of violent confrontation somehow ensued from this. And, this is a, a reconstruction that we are doing based on, uh, you know, the multitude of cameras that were installed on, the, on this NGO ship, right? And I don't know if I can play this. Oops, no, sorry. Uh, can somebody? Oh, right, okay. 
uh, well, this, this was a video just to show you, it's really kind of work in progress, but just to show you know, the kind of forest of cameras that was present on this event and that really is allowing us to, uh, uh, you know, to reconstruct this case, right? Um, oh yes, now it's playing. So each, each of these frames is basically a picture that was taken uh, you know, in, in a short time frame. Uh, and there are all, also a lot of kind of GoPro videos uh, because all the NGOs that, that do search and rescue kind of have mounted uh, uh, GoPros on their, on their helmets. Um, kind of skipping this. Um, however, something interesting started to happen uh, uh, you know, over the last year. Uh, and the point I guess I'm trying to make here is that no actor has final ownership over these images, right? This kind of multiplication of media as well that has happened at sea, uh, neither over the use of AIS or other sensing technologies. This was proven to us very clearly uh, during the last few months um, uh, in a period in which various far-right groups started to use some of the very tools that we had ourselves somehow used and, and developed uh, for very different purposes. And here you see a, a video that was published by a think tank called Gefira, um, which uh, you, know, you can see, you can read the kind of the, the interpretation of this, right? And it's, uh, it uses AIS to somehow suggest kind of conspiracy theory by which you know, there would be, let's say, uh, NGOs that are, are, are uh, you know, trying to, uh, uh, you know, somehow provoke an invasion of, of uh, Europe by, by African migrants, right? That's a kind of narrative that they, uh, uh, you know, put onto this, this video and these images. Uh, another disturbing use of, of AIS was the ways in which identitarian, so-called identitarian groups launch an anti-migrant defend your own campaign and deploy their own anti-search and rescue vessel, the Sea Star that you see here, uh, to hamper search and rescue NGOs operating in the central Mediterranean. And one of the uh, search and rescue NGOs that they targeted, uh, Proactiva Open Arms, denounced at some point the hacking of its AAS signal transmitted by its rescue vessels and the emission of a false position, right? So there is a kind of, you know, there was a, uh, a process of spoofing by which they kind of, you know, uh, transmitted the false position again to kind of make this point that NGOs are, are, let's say, responsible for the invasion of Europe or something like that. Um, so here you can see clearly how somehow the battle for the opening or closure of the Mediterranean frontier was fought through AIS, through the kind of, you know, this, this, this media technology, uh, which after having been used for several years by pro-migrant activists and human rights organizations, became one of the tools employed by these far-right groups to demand even stronger exclusionary measures. So I guess one, my lament here, uh, uh, the fact that, you know, this kind of constant circulation of these practices and tactics might represent but we might also recognize that their multifarious, contested, and unstable life is the very condition for them uh, to shape the world. And, uh, uh, and this was another very interesting use of AIS where the Italian government as well, a, a commission of the Italian Senate also used AIS data uh, to kind of, you know, uh, 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 to show the role that NGOs, and again, it was in a process of criminalization of NGOs conducting search and rescue at sea. Um, so where, where does this leave us, right? I, I guess, you know, I don't have like a, it's a very kind of anti-climax conclusion because I don't have any, you know, major or grand point to make, but I just like to conclude with some questions and trying to, you know, also hopefully kind of get, get some input uh, and, and feedback in regards to how I guess the question for us now is how can we think about some of these tools that we have used and we have engaged with in the space of the sea and bring them back to the space of the city considered as an hostile environment, right? Um, so if, if, if border controls becomes diffused and multiscalars, also migrants' rights and solidarity activism must somehow do the same, right? Uh, uh, against an idea of integrated border management that is a jargon with which 
you know, agencies like Frontex describe border control. That uh, so they they talk about integrated border management as something that operates at, before, and after the border. We also need to oppose a sort of like a form of solidarity that becomes nomadic and that could you know travel and and accompany people, let's say, as they move uh, across different spaces. Um, and uh, so this, this, uh, this slide here is just shows some of the initiatives that have been uh, emerging in the UK in response to this uh, 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 hostile environment legislation. And I guess you know, one of the aim of this kind of projects in the making or, or in the thinking somehow would be to, to engage with that and try to uh, see how spatial analysis could contribute to some of the uh, things that they are doing in order to oppose uh, this hostile environment legislation. I conclude with that. Thank you. I think one question before we start. How do I get a, a video started? When you click next, it'll open up? Okay, thank you. All right, excuse me. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Sebastian Cuarrubias. I uh, wanted to say thanks also for the invitation to come and for Laura and Dare with all the back and forth and Manan for the introduction. Um, we were excited to learn about uh, the center. Um, while we find a lot of potential synergies with a lot of the work we're hearing about, um, it is very different. So it's been a lot of uh, a very eye-opening as well as getting accustomed to new sorts of terms or, or perhaps jargon. <clears throat> While we don't tend to do, uh, use the city or the scale of the urban as our analysis per se, um, hopefully we can get toward the end to some questions that we think will be um, relevant to think through in, in, in urban space. What we're going to kind of do is sort of think about that uh, when Lorenzo ended at that at, before, and after the border. I guess we'll be talking about the before, in a way. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, uh, Menon mentioned, uh, my research companion, and also my wife, uh, Maribel Casas Cortez, uh, couldn't be here, um, you know, as she's kind of the other half of this research. Partly this is due to care duties and the fact that maybe our institutions as well as our cities aren't up to the task of taking on reprodu the reproductive tasks that we all need to do, and, but also because of border, cross, uh, border issues. In this case, it had to do with, um, we were advised a few days ago that her legal presence is up. And uh, which means that you're not supposed to travel or drive and things like that. So now we're, we're solving that. Hopefully in our case it won't be too difficult. But we thought it was very good to have that embodied critique that the panel on borders, both for the internal borders and the external borders, had hacked off half of the panel. All right. But we'll get to hear her voice shortly. So um, what I'll be talking about is a process called border externalization, um, or kind of how the border work, specifically the border work of managing or controlling uh, human mobility uh, of nation states is displaced to regions that are far from their kind of traditional or territorial boundaries. <clears throat> and this is based on the work we've been doing since 2010, and uh, specifically on some maps and visuals that we gathered together for an exhibition called It's Obvious from the Map, uh, curated by Thomas Keenan and uh, Sohrab Mohedi. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll play a kind of brief two and a half minute video that we used uh, there, um, a bit amateur, we're not very savvy with this stuff, but that kind of helps give um, an introduction to what border externalization is, if I can figure out how that works. Oh, there she's talking a radio show about that stuff, and now what? How do, click, is that happening? Yeah. Oh, it is, okay. Migration control increasingly takes place beyond the borders of destination countries. Migrants' journeys are traced using advanced technology and paramilitary deployment that target migrants' supposed places of origin and transit. Over the last five years of refugee crisis, the European Union has increased its bilateral agreements with non-EU countries for the containment of migration flows strengthening collaboration with third countries on border patrolling, surveillance, and interception. Frontex, the European agency in charge of external borders, is reinforcing near real-time data sharing 
on border movements through national coordination centers in EU member states and partner countries. For this sharing of communication, Frontex European National Border Guards and independent research organizations such as the ICMPD are providing technical cooperation and training support to countries at and beyond the external frontiers of Europe. Those were the practices that involve acting beyond territorial lines and in coordination with third countries are referred to as border externalization. The origins of this process of outsourcing border control, including its law abiding tendencies, has its roots in the United States interdiction of Haitian refugees in the early 80s. The conventional understanding of migration control has been that each nation state is in charge of their own borders at their territorial lines and through the management of visas in national embassies abroad. This traditional approach is considered incomplete among EU migration policy circles. Speaking in terms of efficient migration management, the next step is to go beyond the place and time of the entry point. It is necessary to establish a transnational cooperation for border work to track exactly where the migrant is. This system of remote control aims at tracing and managing the entirety of the migration journey. This is how the route has become a migration management concept and strategy. Illegality is constructed in ways that target border crossing before any border is crossed making someone illegal at the very moment and place where she or he decides to migrate. Okay. Right. And how do we recuperate the other thing? Is there a mouse? Oh, someone's doing that robotically. Okay, cool. Or remotely, sorry. <laughs> so uh, the video, there's a bit of a mismatch between the... Um, audio and the visual. The visual is kind of the promo video for Eurosur, which is what the EU and Frontex, the kind of border management coordination body of the European Union, promotes as its kind of real time, as explained, data sharing uh, border crossing surveillance system. Um, what we focus on specifically is kind of what happens, the, the information that is shared before kind of or that builds into the information of those different coordination centers mentioned in the video, <clears throat> and specifically what they call border cooperation projects between countries that are designated destination, transit, and origin, which are official terms. Um, examples of the externalization can be anything from development projects, uh, exporting biometric technology for national ID cards, to paramilitary operations. Um, <clears throat> and. One more final general comment, externalization can include both border work outsourced to other countries or the ability to intervene legally or not in another country. Again, with the goal that you are enforcing your migration policy elsewhere. And that's kind of where all the dilemmas and the legal slippage begins to happen. Uh, much of our analysis has focused on two operations, uh, the Seahorse Project and the West Sahel Project, kind of headed by the uh, Spanish Gendarme Corps, we could say. Um, in collaboration with various North African, West African, and other EU states. Uh, the next few slides then are specifically what the Guardia Civil, uh, the, so the Spanish gendarme, use when talking about these operations. The, the, re, the reasoning behind them, but also specifically kind of this, the spatial thinking behind them, which is what I really want to uh, get, to, get at. So when they're presenting this um, in different think tank or border guard meetings, there's actually like an official um, European day for border guards and it's fun to get all the visuals on how they imagine space. It's EU for BG. Um, this is kind of how they present the reasoning, why we have to do this, the massive immigration as they call it. And you know, it's sometimes important to take a step back and you see the numbers under IMM, you know, 20 people, 92 people. And this is, they're not seeing kind of the, I guess what you could say, the cognitive dissonance between what they're calling massive and what is really not that massive. But you can see the, the reasoning they're beginning to use is that, well, we're not able to really manage this issue um, either at the limits of the continent or even at the limits of possessions like the Canary Islands there uh, towards the upper right of the map. And that we somehow have to interdict these long, in this case, maritime journeys. And to do, to do that, we will displace 
our borders, right? That kind of coastline, that similar coastline that includes southern Morocco, Mauritania, and Senegal. And the idea is the, these are kind of images that they use in their PowerPoints to, to talk about what they should deploy, right? If you can look kind of briefly, you'll see uh, drones, satellites, uh, naval frigate, as well as kind of more Coast Guard vessels. And you can see what they're aiming to get are those small kind of pateras, as they call them, fishing boats or cayucos, right? And kind of showing the excessive deployment to find what is really very small vessels, right? What, you know, it's the kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer approach. <clears throat> and not only temporary deployments, but also the building of what they call, again, these are specifically their their slides, system architectures of communication. The large orange, or well, red and kind of bright yellow ones are the central ones in Madrid and the Canary Islands, and then coordinate with various others. The ones that are shown here in Mauritania, Senegal, Cape Verde, and Portugal. And there's been others deployed in Morocco, and they were hoping, I don't know if it's been successful, to get them into Mali and to Niger, right? So the idea of kind of communication, the communication tends to go from a cooperating country to the Spanish border guards. So there's little horizontal communication in this case. But for what they consider to be police interdiction, it's been very effective. Right? So for them, they say how de facto this is where the border is. And then that architecture helps to coordinate these sorts of operations. Right? What looks like this sort of battleship map um, is actually not kind of, you can see the Spain, uh, the Spain and Mauritanian flag is not a Spanish and Mauritanian boats facing off each other, they symbolize joint patrols. When you see both flags, it means you have uh, you know, armed border guards jointly patrolling. And so then, of course, all the legal issues of, well, if a boat interdicts you under whose jurisdiction, then are you interdicted? Do you fall under Mauritanian asylum law or Spanish asylum law? Um, and all of that becomes very vague, of course, right? And again, that massive deployment all to get that boat. And I believe that mumbo jumbo, I apologize, basically what they're talking about is target and they talk about uh, the names of the different operations they're doing. I'm not sure why that slide got all fumbled up there. <coughs> this is again a, another iteration of that logic. This front, these are, operations are coordinated by Spain, but they have the support of the EU border management agency, in this case Frontex. And Frontex, uh, Frontex is, at least up until the time we finished our research, their longest standing operation was this one off the coast of Western Africa. Um, at times including Gambia, at times not, but at least Mauritania, Senegal, and Cape Verde. And again, that similar idea of what kind of means you deploy, what you're trying to aim at, but also sort of the naturalness, right? When we, this started in 06, when we wrapped up some of the field work, it was like 14. This was all the time. So it was really de facto, what you might call the homeland policy happening there, right? And so all kinds of debates, all the, all the agents would reply back to their interior ministries, even though they're deployed in these coastal waters. The, the agreements with the countries were not official treaties, so there was no way to get kind of open information on them, but they were, they were, so they were neither classified documents. It was very strange terrain. <laughs> and so lawyers couldn't really do much either. Uh, that was just a graphic of Frontex in case people weren't familiar. That's their office in, in Warsaw. That's the only um, Central or Eastern European country that's gotten an EU agency main office. They get the, the border guards. So. When we were um, gathering documents for that exhibit in Los Angeles, uh, Thomas and Sohrab suggested, why don't you grab the top 10 of these images uh, that show kind of how border guards visualize this, this border as being far from their territory and how they conceive of themselves as operating in it. And as we were gathering it, we mentioned this kind of old dusty document from the late 90s called the EU Strategy Paper on Migration and Asylum. And it kind of got us all excited. And we thought of trying to, well, with their support, we were able to get uh, Tim Stallman, a cartographer from the Counter Cartographies Collective, uh, to help us do a quick visual of it. Because uh, what we, we see here is an early geographical imaginary of concentric circles, where the entire world um, and all the countries of the world are put into a circle of mobility, and what kind of access to mobility each circle should have. <clears throat> Um, I'll give a little bit of background on it before kind of getting into each circle. This was pretend the EU has a rotating presence, presidency every six months, and in this case, this was during the Austrian presidency in 1998. 
um, we have a very geographical vision, a kind of simple geographical vision of Europe that scandalized a lot of other EU authorities and EU member states. It seemed like a very restrictive and discriminatory approach to migration, because in a sense it was put out there, right? <clears throat> And we were sometimes reluctant to use this map, and we'd seen it mentioned sporadically by some authors, but we specifically noticed um, it was a, a Moroccan scholar, Abdel Karim Belgandouz, writing about what, how Morocco's policy was changing um, in the face of, well, during the early 2000s, and he says the, mentions the importance, the foundational importance of the spatial imaginary of this document. And so we began to engage in a bit more. And so we want to kind of share how this document proposes how mobility should occur throughout the world, in, divided into four concentric circles. Right? The geographical imaginary very literally puts the Europe in the center, so it's Eurocentric in a very literal sense. <clears throat> and kind of the idea that there should be a, dic not exactly a diktat, but kind of a, a suggestion of who should be able to move, who should not, towards what circle. And Despite the fact that it was kind of voted down, we found that it really begins to underpin a lot of the other operations that we found happened later on. Um, it was criticized, uh, a lot of other non-EU countries criticized it, of course, but then it, per it gets pursued through informal channels. One a very famous one called the High Level Working Group on Migration, uh, chaired by Germany and Holland. We didn't want to make too much of a big deal about it initially because we thought it looked kind of like conspiracy theory, but we found that a lot of the logic kind of seeps in to a lot of the one-off operations or framework policies that we then kind of critique as happening here and happening there, and then we point to a trend. We don't even need to identify the trend. They, they set up the strategy for us. It's, it's not a representation of what happens on the ground, but it does tie a lot of loose ends together for us. <clears throat> so. We wanted to show how slowly but surely this spatial vision um, became kind of an organizing, informal organizing framework of the, e, of the EU's policy of migration management. And uh, while many of the plans and operations fail on the ground, right, we don't claim that this is what the EU border regime looks like, we think that its designation of spaces in the world beyond the EU, it kind of holds intact for the most part. With friction, of course, in terms of there's a pushback, but in terms of how the EU visualizes it, or at least their border management authorities visualize it. Briefly. <clears throat> um, one thing I want to mention is, if, you, if you've been familiar with the critique of Fortress Europe and the fencing or the detention centers, one thing that was very interesting in this document we found out was that Already in 1998, the policymakers were uh, suggesting we need to go beyond a fortress in Europe, uh, Europe. We need a global approach towards managing mobility. And so this is promoted as a kind of a global approach. <coughs> Excuse me, but I'm still recuperating from the flu. The first circle, um, and I'll kind of intersperse this with uh, quotes from the document, is formed by EU member states, as well as um, States that do not cause emigration, those are kind of the light gray, that was their understanding back then. Uh, states that were capable of fulfilling Schengen standards of control, Schengen about the free movement area in the EU. And countries in general that have become quote unquote target countries on account of their advanced economic and political situation. The second circle would consist of what there are called transit countries, which no longer generate emigration, they say, are not significant, significant amounts, but on account of a relatively stable internal economic and political situation, accept only very limited control procedures and, and don't accept much responsibility for migration policy, quote unquote. This second circle at the time would include some countries that then became later EU members, that were neighbors of Schengen, and what they call perhaps the Mediterranean area. The idea of it being that these countries' systems should be brought gradually into line with first circle standards. The third circle would form countries of both emigration and transit. They mentioned the Soviet Union, or well, former Soviet Union, Turkey, North Africa, and these countries would be required to facilitate primarily uh, transit checks and combating smuggler networks. Right, so well, the role for if different circles and the, um, for governments in different circles was distinct. The fourth one, the outermost, would consist of countries of emigration. Apparently, uh, what they say are beyond European political muscle. This is the quote. And they mention specifically, again in quotes, the Middle East, China, and in the non-redacted version, black Africa. That is the term they use. 
these countries are encouraged to eliminate push factors. Right? You, you, don't, you don't combat smuggling here, you eliminate push factors. Rewards would follow to each uh, country if they meet the obligations arising from their designation in a circle. As they put it here, quote, for example, second circle countries must meet Schengen standards as a precondition for EU membership or for advanced trading status. For the third circle, intensified economic cooperation is linked to the ful fulfillment of their obligations. And the fourth circle, the extent of development aid can be assessed on that basis, on the basis of cooperation. <clears throat> so we see a very Euro-concentric vision of mobility, very apparent. And what this helped us to do is, um, again, frame those single study cases into an overall, wait, that's not supposed to be there, but okay, an overall logic, right? We run into different projects and policy plans. This one is called the European Neighborhood Policy on the left, first countries that will have advanced trading status with the EU, and the kind of migration policy they're supposed to have is supposed to be up to almost Schengen standards, at least in terms of control, not in terms of free movement. A project that we focused on, West Sahel, is all about combating facilitator networks or smuggling networks. <clears throat> so what we see is that even though these policies post-date that document by 10 years or more, they're really following that same logic of this concentric circles. <clears throat> now, one thing is that the concentric circles seem a little bit static. What can come out of that, that um, would be interesting to follow, especially since countries are going to move from circle to circle. Right? This can't be uh, at all as the EU proposes, of course. And one of the, let me move quickly here, uh, one of the ways that this spatial imaginary actually is operationalized is through something that we call, uh, sorry, something that we study called migration routes management. This is a strategy that the EU proposes in 2005. Um, where you see the kind of knowledge that emerges from the circle thinking, the concentric circle thinking, and how it kind of tries to predict future movement based on itineraries that are traced and then officially mapped. And we looked specifically at the work of uh, a think tank called the International Center on Migration Policy Development, which um, is awarded a lot of uh, funds to conduct this work, and how they try to help the EU carry out this roots management approach. <clears throat> So the idea was if the concentric circles designate countries into a mobility zone, the root strategy tries to operationalize it by identifying relationships between circles according to what they identify as migrant itineraries, whether they actually reflect migrant mobilities is a whole other question. So if a route traversed countries in various circles, then the idea was those countries had to cooperate as destination, transit, and origin countries, and establish different strategies in each country in order to either lower the pressure of the route or to close the route, as sometimes they, they officially uh, explicitly say. So you kind of, in a sense, you're sort of chopping a lot of mobility, right? There's no intra-African migration here, which is much larger than the migration going towards Europe, right? It's mostly focused on identifying hubs, spokes, uh, or sometimes what they call nodes, and then finding out where, if those are origins, transits, destination is only Europe, apparently, so that doesn't really account, and then articulating a kind of process of cooperation amongst countries along that route. So there's a lot that can be said about those maps and their visual work. Um, countries have no names, they only use ISO codes for that, <laughs> but we can perhaps get to that later. What we kind of began to identify is that the route itself becomes a border zone or even an itinerant border, right? If we talked about maps that move, maybe we can talk about borders that move here. <clears throat> and that the route hides all the, just to reflect on something I said in the, the last talk by Leah, it, this kind of maps hide all the frictions, the time spent along the route, the blockages. And when we would negotiate, uh, we would bring some of this research into one of the, when we were doing this mostly when we were living in Spain and participating with a migrant rights association, we would screen these maps uh, to the people being mapped, right? And they would talk about that frustration and how they wanted to create, in a sense, a series of counter maps, um, mostly just to work through this process of what it meant to kind of be mapped. <coughs> there are more examples. They have animated versions of the map where you can follow the development of routes. Um, Frontex and other institutions have also taken on this roots logic and kind of made it more dramatic, right? So this front text, this is their version of the route and how you have this kind of overwhelming pressure towards especially Italy and elsewhere. 
there was a recent artistic uh, art exhibit, sorry, in New York called The Unwanted Population um, that focused on actually piling together a bunch of these different maps from different agencies, such as the ICMPD, um, the International Organization of Migration Frontex, and kind of creating more um, aesthetically pleasing collages of it. Uh, I just mentioned that because it happened recently here. So this sort of logic of border agencies doing this kind of mapping has been sort of spreading to other agencies. <clears throat> um, some of the slides kind of got a little misplaced, but let me mention one of the things that we sort of see here, um, and this is very incipient in terms of uh, actually being able to create uh, uh, something visual that could accompany it. Uh, it's very clearly a very, at least an attempt, colonial ordering of populations and of territories. Um, we also found interesting that in the initial iteration of the routes, the EU country designated to, in charge of a route was often designated to manage routes through former colonies that now doesn't currently hold, which is why this map has some issues. But uh, we think it interesting to, to look at that process. What is that, that sort of struggle between a logic where you can kind of designate where people should move and order the populations they're in and sort of the pushback. And we just kind of end this idea of, or this debate on the circles and on border externalization with this quote from Achille Mbembe, uh, uh, with recent, uh, recent magazine article, I guess, in this uh, South African is it magazine, I can't remember what the name is, sorry, I'm forgetting, but the link, the link is in there, called Scrap the Borders That Divide Africans, right? The next phase of Africa's decolonization is about granting mobility to all her people, reshaping the terms of membership in a political and cultural ensemble that is not confined to the nation state. Freedom of movement within Africa becomes a cornerstone of a new pan-African agenda. And we end on that partly because what we're seeing on the part mostly of, of movements in places like Senegal, Mauritania, as well as even on the part of governments in, in different countries, is a lot of debate and pushback on these externalization approaches. Sometimes there's cooperation and sometimes there's direct friction. Um, and let me end now with maybe a few questions to bring it back to the scale of the city, because we don't usually think that way, but um, one of the things that was happening in the organization we worked with was a campaign, as we were talking about these different, different kinds of research on externalization and how many of the members were sort of already othered well before they made any decision to, or any, at least any kind of itinerary in their migratory process or journey, um, <clears throat> there was a campaign called Ciudades Sin Fronteras, right? Cities Without Borders. And what would it look like to have cities without borders? I can't make a direct link there, but we did begin to sort of ask those questions and start a kind of a local campaign around there. And we sort of ended then thinking, well, how does externalization enable practices of bordering in urban places? Right? If bordering works as a form of governing populations, what would be the structures and protocols that are constantly creating or recreating hierarchies among people? On the one hand, we have things like how externalization marks you. Like the video says, you are illegal from the point you are assumed to be on the move. Right? How that then will condition your status once you arrive. Uh, at whatever destination or country of residence you're at. This is the image of kind of a, a bum rush when California allowed uh, driver's licenses to be more easily accessible and the intensity to try and achieve them. So how that changes kind of the access to different sorts of resources and services ur in an urban environment. But what we also don't tend to ask is what are the specific results on urban environments where externalization happens, right? So this change, the externalization transforms things like the fishing industry into car. It creates a lot of jobs for new police forces as well. It makes hanging out as a group of young men much more difficult because you're profiled as a migrant, right? Uh, very detailed work on this profiling practice, specifically in Senegal, has been done by anthropologist Ruben Anderson. It's very, very interesting to see. It's hard to hang out if you have backpacks. You have to hang out without backpacks now. Because if you have a backpack, it means you're a migrant. Right? So all the, even these sort of daily life practices in urban space are changing through the results of externalization. But they don't stay in place. Since the border's following the route, sometimes it moves along. And now we see this happening much more in places like Khartoum in Sudan. Itinerant housing that emerges on the outskirts of cities like Rabat. Um, Morocco has been very cooperative with externalization, um, but now more recently is pushing back. So I'll close with those questions. and. Uh, Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, um, Lorenzo and Sebastian. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we're running a little, perhaps a lot behind. Um, I will simply um, kind of ask a, a few questions and help you kind of uh, remake some of the points. Um, and then we'll go to our, our uh, concluding keynote. So, um, Lorenzo, let me start with your um, very sobering presentation. Um, one of the things that I have a Google alert for is the, um, the reporting in Pakistan of Pakistani migrants who die uh, in um, the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of um, <coughs> identification of, the, of the, the migrant body that happens after the, the horror has uh, occurred. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the national presses then have to do this kind of forensic at the other level uh, where um, those who are supposed to be of Pakistani descent, whether they're Afghan or Pakistan or, or Iranian or whoever they might be, um, and the national presses then kind of recap those stories as stories of um, Pakistani deaths. Mm -hmm. And as I was listening to your um, presentation and the ways in which you were sort of framing the, the, the tension between tool as, as control and tool as emancipation and the narrative that either side of the tool can create. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about sort of the, the, this, the, the ways in which the body, the, the, the body of the migrant, the, body, the movable and, and then immobile body have, goes through its own forensics. And if you could tell us about what that forensics looks like mm -hmm. um, after, after the accident has happened, after the, um, the horror has, has revealed. Because I suspect that, uh, that uh, similar politics of forensics that undergird the type of surveillance and type of mapping that you've been talking about happens on the body itself. Mm -hmm. And as, as Sebastian's work so, you know, uh, was sort of pointing out, that that surveillance follows the, the, the young male as they kind of come together with a backpack. And so, you know, not just the border is following, but a type of forensics is also following, that is, that is switching them from um, a young man in, hanging out with his friends to a possible group of migrants who are going to now head off. And so the, the sort of necropolitics here uh, in, in, in of surveillance, um, I'm very curious uh, if, if both either both of you can sort of speak very briefly about that. And to the question of the sort of movable borders, um, the CBP, of course, um, designates um, 100 miles uh, from the, the sort of uh, point of entry as a legal border zone for the United States. So we are currently uh, in, in um, a border uh, region where the CBP officers can, of course, deport me or um, anyone else here who is, um, can be deemed deportable. Um, and when you fly, as I often do to South Asia, the United States, uh, the CBP also has the border control in uh, UAE and uh, in Istanbul, so in, in these hubs, where the architecture of the space is meant to uh, mimic in its sort of uh, material detail the as if you were standing at Dulles or as if you're standing at JFK. So the very formal sense the airport is transformed with a uh, different built environment to, to mock a U.S. border uh, patrol and that's where someone like me would have to go through um, in, uh, in um, boarding a flight, uh, a connecting flight. Um, so I'm also interested in, uh, in both of your thoughts on, on this type of sort of mimicking of the border, uh, both, in, both in, in sort of the, we, can, we call post-colonized or hyper-colonized uh, spaces, uh, but also as, as sort of um, nodes on this, this larger global uh, route. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, um, what I find um, sort of both your perhaps um, exasperated ending, what is, what is to be done, uh, and, and your kind of 
um, idealistic ending <laughs> through Membe mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, the border is what defines the nation states and not vice versa, although the technology would argue otherwise. Um, and, I, and I wonder if there are points of intersection here uh, and if both of you can kind of think about um, the ways in which the long history of EU actually forces us to rethink um, the ways in which bordered regimes are actually racial regimes. Mm -hmm. And the, it's not that the border uh, disappears in the EU Schengen, but actually new communities are made white mm -hmm. um, as they uh, clear uh, a hurdle, and uh, that speaks also to the sort of now forgotten efforts of, the, of, of Turkey to, to proclaim their, 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 uh, their Europe-ness over a long period. So um, please feel free to take any of these suggestions and, 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 and respond, and the uh, floor is yours. You want to go ahead? Go for it. Um, thanks a lot. These are really like interesting and, and thought-provoking. Uh, ideas. I guess, I mean, maybe to start with your first question about, you know, the forensics of the, of the body, right? I mean, obviously, there would be a lot to be said there, and, and you know, it obviously works in many different ways in, in different uh, countries, in different, like, places, and in different, you know, temporal contexts, so it's very, it's very diverse. But maybe, I mean, one way of, of responding to that um, always in, in line with, you know, this idea that you were also mentioning that I was trying to put forward of how, you know, these different kind of media and technologies, et cetera, are used both as a tool of emancipation and as a tool of control. It was interesting for, for me, for us, let's say, to see, uh, you know, also how, to a certain extent, a certain kind of recuperation of bodies and identification practices are also kind of part of the apparatus of control in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, especially um, after two uh, uh, huge shipwrecks that happened in the Mediterranean, in one in 2013 and the other in 2015, which I talked about uh, recently, uh, you know, the, the Italian government spent actually quite a huge amount of money to, to try to retrieve some of those bodies mm -hmm. and to identify them to kind of bring them back to the families, right? Uh, which was something quite unprecedented, right? Because most of the people, in fact, are not identified, etc., right? So in a sense, of course, there was something positive in that, but at the same time, the kind of whole spectacle of compassion and you know I, I have pictures of like you know how the anger of, of like the, the airport in, in Lampedusa and on you know this tiny island was transformed into a huge kind of media kind of space slash mortuary right where mm -hmm. all the all the uh, uh, how do you say like the the, the, the the bodies basically were lined up right mm -hmm. and and um, so this kind of like compassionate you know face of the state uh, was also the place where then, you know, European leaders like gave their speeches basically saying, oh, you know, we need to stop death, right? Nobody can right. accept death. So how do we do that? Well, we, you know, we trample the, the, the budget of Frontex, right? We ramp up, you know, militarization, border control, etc., etc., etc. So in a way, it becomes, a, you know, another ways in which the kind of spectacular visibilization of death becomes another tool to reinforce, you know, once again, border control. Exactly, right? as in, the, or, it goes to what Sebastian was pointing out, the origin, right? So the forensics of the body is actually to pinpoint the origin such that the origin can be then made a partner. Uh, so Australia, for example, does that very successfully uh, for its uh, capture and, and incarceration of, of migrants, where they take out ads in newspapers in Urdu and in Pashto, in, right. in, uh, particularly with, with faces of, of the captured to say, look, you know, you are the origins and is, at the origin we need to find partners and we need to stop this. So the forensics of the body, the compassion is, is, is one way of thinking about how it's the origin that's at stake and, right. and a body must be identified right. in order for the policing and for the, you know, um, sort of uh, the necropolitics of the body to actually be played out. Right. And, and maybe just briefly to, to say, you know, a kind of uh, another connected by opposite somehow like process is the ones by which instead you know the fact that actually most of, most of times bodies are not retrieved right and and there is a kind of you know enduring absence that somehow you know becomes politically much more 
uh, you know, generative and, and interesting, right? There's a whole movement that in Tunisia specifically that, that uh, you know, uh, emerged out of this, you know, what, what they were called the le, le disparu, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, you know, the disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. People who, who died at sea just after the revolution, right? And that kind of spurred a whole kind of, you know, social movement effectively. Of, of mothers and, and relatives of, of the people who disappear to demand, you know, to the, to the newly uh, formed state as well as to, to the mm. EU and the Italian government, you know, what happened to, to our sons, right? Yeah. So just wanted to contrast this. Um. Yeah, um, just to respond to a couple of those uh, interesting points. One thing, uh, I don't do surveillance studies. Um, and perhaps this is something I already talked about a lot, but in, we talk about it a lot in cartographic theory. When you were talking about the surveillance um, of the border moving, sometimes I, I wonder, surveillance for me, it implies that you're watching something that is happening. And I think what's happening with, or externalization is that you're imposing the intent before it even happens, uh -huh. or at least imposing a directionality, uh -huh. right? There's, we can't assume that someone, let's say from Gambia, that is working in Cote d'Ivoire is trying to get to France. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unless they expressly tell you and they have a ticket that says, you know. And so I think it's almost more than surveillance, it's imposing a regime of mobility that may not really reflect the dynamic mobilities, not only within, in this, in the case, the African continent, but also between the EU and Africa, mm -hmm. right? Migration from Spain to Morocco is net positive in more Spaniards migrating towards Morocco than vice versa for the past few years. Mm -hmm. That doesn't reflect at all in any of this. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a surveillance that really imposes an order. Mm -hmm. um, it's not seeing what's happening, it's seeing perhaps based on those former knowledges that we have and that we want to keep seeing that was discussed in, in, uh, in Wendy's uh, discussion. Um, to reflect on what you were um, discussing, that, that, that feeling of the architecture, that it follows you in the UAE and, and, and Istanbul or in, in Canada and Mexico and in all kinds of places. Um, <clears throat> I have seen those nodes, that kind of firm nodes in other places, in different airports and things like that. What, what we're looking at here, I wonder if we can talk about kind of an, in a mimicry um, not just of the architectural form, but also kind of an, an itinerant mic mimic mimicking of the border and its logics, which can take um, a very firm architectural form or something a bit more ephemerant. Mm -hmm. I, I use, we use itinerant, I mean, we talk about itinerant bordering assemblages when we look at the different legal architectures that go on into this mm -hmm. and the organizational architectures. Because we often find, while you might have different local associations or national groups, you often will see Funding agencies are coming from the same places. The sorts of training they get is the same. The sorts of ID cards they get and the company that makes the ID card that embeds the biometric data is the same and it's imported to country after country. So there's a mimicking of these infrastructures, I guess you would say, and also what they try to control. Right? So one of the things that we saw happen, both on the positive, let's say, on the exasperated and the optimistic side in Morocco and different Moroccan um, researchers and activists who talk about this was the emergence of, if there were tensions, the emergence of a, clear, a clearer racialized divide. Mm -hmm. And the emergence also of an anti-racist movement in Morocco. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of that, that, that idea that you kind of ID people, that they belong here, that they shouldn't be coming, they're being pushed. And so that, in a sense, it's not that that was absent, perhaps, but that it becomes all the more real the more you survey it, mm -hmm. right? And um, on the other hand, though, that imposition misses all the, that slippage, mm -hmm. right? Both the fact that in those circles, it's assumed that no one from circle one will ever go to two or three. And right. we know that's not true. Right. Um, it assumes that people within two and three and four don't really move between each other. And that, we know that's not true. Um, it, it assumes that also the governments will, uh, of circles two, three, and four will always cooperate with number one, or they'll always cooperate with the same intent. Yeah. And we know that's also not true. So there's, you know, in that also that export and mimicking of this infrastructure of the border, there's points of slippage that I, I don't want to be overly optimistic, but uh, sometimes I have to be to not be too exasperated. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I, let, let's let's leave it at that, and uh, let me thank you both for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.